All right, so uh, welcome everyone to the UCLA Planetarium Show. Uh, we will begin starting in a few minutes. We'll just give us a little bit more time for a few extra people to roll in before I go ahead and get started. We're still pretty early. All right, so I will wait one more minute and then I'll go ahead and get started. Hello everyone. Okay, so I'll get started in just a moment. All right, well, I think it's about a good time to get started. So I'm gonna just go ahead and take it away. So welcome everyone um welcome to this night's uh planetarium show i am rory bentley i am a graduate student and one of the um co kind of operators of the ucla planetarium tonight i'm going to be giving to you a presentation on our search for life in other worlds so this is you know the sun the, the hunt for aliens essentially uh before i'd like to get start get started, I'd like to give special thanks to uh, fellow graduate students Mason McDougall for helping out with the slides, along with Briley Lewis, Ronald Lopez, uh, Aiden Gibbs, and a number of other students, all who helped me and helped the UCLA Planetarium get this show um, on the go for tonight. So everyone give thanks to them. So let's get started. Let's go. Okay, so one of the biggest questions ever asked is, are we alone in the universe? 
is there somewhere else in the cosmos, some other being, some other race, something like us? The answer is, we don't know yet. Um, this, but it's been one of the biggest sort of drivers of astronomy uh, over in the entirety of history, this search for, you know, something like us elsewhere in the universe. It's a very hard question to ask. One of the reasons is, well, we need to know where to look for it. And, well, that's a challenging question. We also need to know how to find it. There's a the thing is, when we look at life on the Earth, we find that it's tremendously varied in, you know, what, what it looks like, what it does, and all sorts of things. Yeah, bacteria versus me, you, things like that. And they, they live and thrive in different environments. Additionally, they also have different sort of things that we can look for. Like we could look for, you know, gas coming out of biological processes, like how Earth's, like the oxygen in Earth's atmosphere, that's all from biological processes. Or we could also look for just direct communications. These are like technosignatures versus um, biosignatures, which are more explicit signs of life in general. And we don't really know, well, which one of these is better or kind of where to start really for looking for these. Additionally, this is made even more complicated by we don't even have a real definition of what we consider to be life. Um, there's, it's obviously very varied on the surface of the earth and it, but we don't really have, you know, some concrete like definition that we can look to for life. We just sort of know it when we see it. This, what this has been, um, one of the kind of the key, uh, key drivers of all this discussion. So even though we don't have a li life, like a definition for life, we do know, we kind of, we do know some things in common that kind of makes up life. Uh, we know it all is a very, it's all ordered, like beings have certain structures, they all reproduce, grow, respond, and evolve based on environmental conditions. This is, that's sort of the, the most fundamental aspect, the fundamental characteristics of life. We also know that um, life comes in on, it, it all requires a couple different, um, a couple different elements. We all, all the life that we know of, or all the life on earth, is all carbon based. Um, it also all requires water. So these are two th properties that we believe are essential to life. Well, actually, I should say, we believe they're essential for life as we know it. There are substitutes for carbon and water, and we'll come back to that later. Life can, in principle, evolve without, could, in, at least in theory, evolve without either of these two things. But we can use our, um, our existence as sort of a stepping stone, a sort of a, a starting place for life, for finding life in the universe. So, life as we know it requires certain environmental conditions. Uh, because we're based on water, we need to have, you know, some world, we need to evolve on some world that has liquid water on its surface. And you can't just find liquid water anywhere in space. You need to find the right temperature. If your planet is too hot, the water will all boil away into the atmosphere. If it's too cold, it'll freeze as hard as rock. So we need to find some sweet spot uh, around a star or something where we're able to have liquid water on its surface. We call this region, we call it the habitable zone, and it's centered rough, like, at least in our solar system, it's centered roughly where the Earth is. It extends out a little further and a little inwards, and we're kind of in the middle. Different types of stars will have different habitable zones in different locations. Now, I mentioned stars because stars are very important to solar systems. And as they're kind of the primary source of energy that drives life, they are very important to its own development. 
And when we look at stars in astronomy, we find that they have a tremendous amount of variety uh, amongst them. You have stars that are much colder than the sun, stars that are way hotter, stars that are way brighter, stars that are way fainter than the sun. And all of these things are very important to uh, the conditions on the planets surrounding them. Uh, if we take stars that are too big and too bright, um, they're typically also too hot, they emit a lot of high energy uh, radiation, in particular ultraviolet radiation. Ultraviolet radiation, when it strikes, you know, complex carbon compounds like DNA and RNA, the stuff that makes up life as we know it, it will break it down and render it effectively useless. So we know that the biggest and hottest stars can't develop life around them because they just emit too much of this UV radiation for life as we know it. Additionally, the coolest stars have their own suite of problems, which we'll come back to later in the talk. We end up with this sort of region of temperature uh, in uh, the different types of stars that contains stars that we can, uh, that life can develop around. The sun is a good example of a pretty regular star that's very well suited for the development of life around in its planets. Now, there's other layers to the development of life. It's not just the star and where the planet is. We also need the surface conditions of the planet to be just right. If your uh, planet's atmosphere is too thick, then it can have a runaway greenhouse effect. Now, in that case, the atmosphere itself will essentially trap heat from the star on the surface of the planet, heating it up until it is just, there's too much and it starts reaching an equilibrium temperature. Uh, this can actually be such a dramatic effect, it can completely boil off the um, water on the surface of these planets. You can have hundreds of greenhouse effects that um, raise the temperature by hundreds of degrees. On the other end, if you have too thin an atmosphere, well, water, liquid water can actually only exist under a certain atmospheric pressure. If the atmosphere is too thin, then this water will just boil off. So you, you again, kind of like the temperature, you need to have an atmospheric sweet spot. I haven't even touched on you need on getting the right atmospheric composition. That's another thing. So long story short, life requires a whole bunch of, you know, things to be just right in order for it to occur. Now, uh, for a lot of these, you know, things to line up, we really don't have a good idea of, say, uh, how frequently life will develop on the surface of a planet. Because we only know of one world where life exists. Uh, this is not even talking about, you know, can how frequently do technologically advanced civilizations occur. So the point of what that I'm trying to make is that life could be very rare in the universe based on our current understanding of the development of the surface of planets. However, life could also be very common and even within our sort of our understanding. We just we just don't know how these processes occur, their frequencies, you know, what how common they are. So life could be everywhere. It could be we could be the only civilization in the galaxy or we could be one of millions. We just don't know. We don't have any constraints here. We do, however, have some guesses as to what we will find. These are more educated guesses based on the life that we find on the Earth. When you look in like science fiction, you know, you go to the movies, or you would go to the movies if we weren't in a pandemic. Uh, when you go to the movies, you will typically see an alien that looks something like us. It's flesh and blood. You know, walking, talking, they got arms, things like that. Uh, that's probably not what we will find. We're more likely to find germs and bacteria, so something much less exciting. Uh, germs and bacteria are one of the most uh, common, in fact, they're the most common form of life, and they're also one of the most capable. They can adapt to almost 
every single environment on the surface of the planet. You can find them way high in the Earth's atmosphere and at the bottoms of the ocean. Uh, the most extreme forms of life we call extremophiles. They live in very strange uh, exotic locations like these black smokers which occur in, on uh, volcanic vents at the bottom of the ocean. And we think that these are one of the most uh, likely forms of life that we will find because they are so adaptable. Uh, we could, the fact that they're so adaptable means that they can evolve and thrive in many more environments than flesh and blood people. So all of that is just speculation. You know, where, what we expect to find, you know, the things that go into life. What are we actually doing in terms of searching for life on other worlds? That's a big question, and astronomers are doing, well, a lot. They've actually been doing a lot for a long time. Uh, some of the, the, fir the hunt for life has uh, probably goes back 2,000 years or something like that. But the first real big event that I'm going to talk about uh, took place in the late... Um, late 1800s, so around, I think, 1880. Uh, at that time, there was an astronomer named Giovanni Scaparelli. He was an Italian astronomer, and he had a big telescope, one of the biggest in the world. And he wanted to produce a map of the surface of Mars. Mars is one of the nearest planets, and so you can actually see the surface quite nicely, and you can make out features on it. When he looked at Mars with his big telescope, he saw something rather odd. He saw black smudges on the surface with these strange dots connecting them. He called the, or these strange lines connecting them. He called these lines canali, which means channels. And through a combination of, you know, imagination and mistranslation, people began to think that these canali, or channels, were, um, you know, they were constructions of some big super civilization on the surface of Mars. That was, say, moving water around for great irrigation projects. We now know that that's not the case at all. The surface of Mars is a cold, dead desert. Um, there's no life as we, uh, that we know of on the surface. The atmosphere is too thin for any sort of liquid water. However, if you look at the surface, look at the geologic you know, patterns on the surface, we see that there is evidence of a vast, almost global ocean. We see rivers, we see lakes, we see big old floodplains, cool things like that that we see very frequently on the surface of the Earth. The only difference is these are billions of years old. Something happened uh, on the surface of Mars that caused it to lose its ocean. It was probably just atmospheric loss from uh, solar effects. So there's no real life there today. No real water on the surface. However, recent findings have found that, the water, that Mars contains water ice trapped below the surface, especially near the poles. Mars is warm enough that it's not unreasonable to, be, unreasonable to believe that you could have pockets of liquid water elsewhere in the surface, and we just need to find them these liquid water pockets could be potential reservoirs containing ancient Martian life. Sort of a last refuge of a dying uh, ecosystem. Stay tuned. We're, we're currently launching tons of space missions to try and figure this out. When we look at our next door neighbor, uh, our next nearest neighbor, Venus, we find an actually somewhat similar story. Uh, Venus, when you look at it through a telescope, what you see is a big planet roughly the size of the Earth covered in bright white clouds. You know what we find on Earth? Bright, bright white clouds. On Earth, these clouds are made of water ice. And Venus is, it's kind of at the edge of the habitable zone, of the habitable zone, and so it's entirely plausible that you could have ice water ice water clouds on, or water ice clouds around the planet. It could be that Venus just has a big global ocean, it has a lot of water, so it has a lot of thick clouds. We thought about, we thought that this might be the case for a long time. However, 
in the late 50s and the, the 60s, once the first spacecraft started to visit Venus, we found a, um, a different story. Venus, those clouds, that atmosphere, it's not water ice. It's sulfuric acid and things like that. There's a lot of carbon dioxide in Venus's atmosphere, and it's also much thicker than anticipated. Carbon dioxide is an excellent greenhouse gas, it, uh, and Venus has it in great abundance. Venus's surface temperature is over 800 degrees. It's hot enough to melt lead. And in fact, uh, the surface temperatures and pressures are so difficult, so extreme, that it actually took the Russians six separate probes to try and land on the surface. Each time they tried to land, their probe would melt just because of how extreme the conditions would, were on the surface. Eventually, they did land on the surface and returned this nice picture that we see on the, on the right. The probe died shortly after because of the extreme conditions. So Venus is on, on a kind of a sad story in the search for life. It had such potential, but it, it turned out to be not. Or did it? Uh, just last month, there was a big announcement that sort of shook up the search for life. Uh, stu a study of the atmosphere of Venus found that it contained lots of a gas called phosphine. Now, phosphine on the Earth is almost entirely a byproduct of Na of natural processes, like, uh, or biological processes, I should say, uh, like microbes and stuff. And we find it in great quantities in Venus, in Venus's atmosphere. Far too, far too higher abundances than can be explained through, uh, you know, volcanism and lightning and things like that. So we don't really know where this comes from. The only idea that we have is perhaps is microbes. This is an interesting possibility that sort of it's not as implausible as it seems, because I didn't mention that Venus's atmosphere, as you go higher and higher, it actually gets cooler. And in the upper layers of the atmosphere, there is a space where it's not too extreme. It's still kind of warm, but you could plausibly have some sort of extremophile develop in the upper atmosphere of Venus, where it just floats around and creates this phosphine. So this is a big discovery, and it's very recent too, so uh, you'll expect to hear a lot about this as astronomers try and figure out what's going on. Now, the two objects that we looked at just a moment ago, Venus and Mars, are roughly within the habitable zone, maybe a little bit outside. For our next object, Jupiter's moon Europa, we're moving way outside of the habitable Jupiter's moon Europa is, uh, it's a, it orbits uh, Jupiter, when Jupiter is a long way from the sun. At best distances, rock, um, water is frozen as hard as rock. But Europa is in a, an interesting location because it's, it's caught in a gravitational tug of war between Jupiter's, uh, two of Jupiter's large outer moons and the planet itself. The moons and the planet stretch and squeeze the insides of Europa and heat it up. The end result is it's a, a very, there's a lot of geological activity going on deep within Europa, and this heats up uh, the moon. Uh, Europa's surface, when we look at it, it's just a thick layer, it's just covered completely in water ice. Now, interestingly, this water ice when we look at it, it has these big cracks, big cracks, kind of like um, when we look at, you know, breaking up icebergs in the Arctic. And we, what we think is going on is this, is that Europa's crust is actually sitting on top of a global ocean. We think that the uh, geological heating of the moon is uh, melting the lower layers of the crust. And so what we're seeing is, you know, just the ice sheet on top of the ocean. It's, again, entirely plausible that, kind of like how we have life in the very deep, very extreme portions of the Earth's oceans, there could be similar forms of life on the surface of Europa. Or, not on the surface, in the depths of the European Ocean. Now, this is another place that we should be looking at for future space missions, as NASA has floated around, oops, uh, sorry for the pun, 
floated around several ideas of to, to launch a submarine that, that will remotely drill through the crust of Europa and into the uh, Europa, Euro, European Ocean. It'll then explore and produce, you know, lots of cool things, hopefully find some sort of life. Our next world is even weirder and even further out of the habitable zone. Saturn's moon Titan is the largest moon, or it's not the, it's the second largest moon in the solar system, and it's the only moon in the solar system with a thick atmosphere. When we look at its atmosphere, we find that it, it's mostly nitrogen, kind of like the Earth, and it also contains large amounts of methane. Uh, methane and is a carbon compound and is top typically you know, found with life on the Earth. And so this is a pretty interesting find. What's just as interesting is that we also see on the surface of Titan uh, lakes and oceans of liquid um, ethane and methane. Now at the distance of Titan from the Sun, water is a frozen super solid. There's no way you could get flowing water on the surface of Titan. But we see extensive lakes and kind of cycles, hydrological cycles, of this liquid natural gas. Now what's really cool is that uh, studies, have, studies have shown that these carbon compounds that make up natural gas and so, and so on are actually, you could plausibly get some form of life form based on these uh, carbon compounds rather than, say, water. So Titan, even though it's like minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit, is a place that we can look for life. That is the last you know, major body that we're going to discuss in, in the solar system. But there's one other place we should look. We should also look in comets and asteroids. Now, when we think about comets and asteroids in the context of life, we think about, you know, the impact that killed the dinosaurs. We think of a big mountain falling out of the sky, hitting the earth, hitting the surface of the earth, catching almost all life on the on the earth on fire, bad things like that. These comets and asteroids, when we think about them, they end life. They don't bring it. However, what we found when we studied comets and asteroids is that both of them contain lots of carbon-rich materials. Carbon-rich materials that, in the conditions of space, could possibly uh, form the building blocks of, actually, no, not possibly, we, we find that they do, in fact, form the building blocks of DNA and RNA. And it's not unreasonable, it's possible, that you could have an asteroid or something where these carbon compounds do combine to form, well, DNA, essentially. And additionally, when we look at comets, comets are, they contain lots of carbon-rich materials like asteroids, but they're also made almost entirely of water and ices. It's now thought that comets were actually very important to uh, develop the development of oceans on the surface of the Earth. In the earliest days of the solar system, they, the Earth was getting pelted by comets and asteroids at all the, all the time. Uh, these comet impacts delivered a ton of water to the surface of the Earth. We think that this water, uh, which would, it, it would get uh, dispersed into the atmosphere on an impact and then condense as rain, we think that it, eventually all this water became the Earth's ocean. And additionally, these also would have brought lots of carbon-rich material to the surface of the Earth, which could develop into the uh, flesh and blood that we see today. So that just about wraps up our discussions of our own solar system. But we're in modern, you know, 21st century astronomy. Uh, starting in 1995, there was a revolution in uh, the study of life and in astronomy in general, or the study, the search for life in astronomy. In 1995, we found the first planet around a sun-like star. This was this was a huge deal in astronomy, and it's it basically kickstarted a, a revolution in the field. 
where we were suddenly able to find planets around other stars. If we knew about planets around other stars, we can find Earth-like planets. Once we find Earth-like planets, we can try and find ways to glean their properties, figure out what's going on on their surfaces, maybe figure out, say, how many planets there are in the universe, how many of them develop life, things like that. Now, one of the reasons it took so long to find these planets is that it's a very tricky thing to find. Planets are tiny compared to stars. They're tiny and they're very faint. So we have to get pretty clever and pretty um, kind of finicky with how we find these, these uh, planets. One of the most successful, in fact, the most successful way of finding planets is through a method we call the transit method. In the transit method, what we do is we point our telescope at a star. Uh, we just watch the star for a very long time. We hope that uh, the star will have a planet that just happens to drift in front of the star and in its orbit. Uh, when we look at what we call at, um, a plot of the brightness of the star versus time, so look at how bright the star is over time, uh, we can when the planet passes in front of the star, the star will get just a little bit fainter. Uh, when the planet moves out of the way, it'll get brighter again. Uh, we look at this brightness versus time plot, uh, which we call a light curve in astronomy, and we can, if we make you know precise enough measurements, we can see this little drop. And that is how we found most of the planets that we know of. Now, um, we work at, uh, us at the UCLA Planetarium, uh, we're all astronomers in the UCLA uh, astronomy department, so I'm sort of contractually obligated to mention this method of finding planets, uh, which is what one of the things that our department sort of specializes in. Um, so this method is called direct imagery. It is the most straightforward way to find a planet. You just you point your telescope at a star and you take a picture and you, you hope that you can see a planet around it. Uh, oftentimes what we do is we actually block out the star so that you can see the planets around it easier. Um, now this has been pretty successful in finding planets, especially big ones further far away from the star. And um, this kind of picture shows one of the kind of the coolest systems we've found. It's the HR8799 system, which we was one of the first, I think the first, one of the first direct, directly imaged systems. Uh, and um, we've been studying it over almost a decade now, and for over a decade now, and we can now have enough data to kind of make a little movie showing the planets orbiting the star. We know that HR8799 has four big whopping planets around it that are a long way from the star. Kind of like how we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune around our sun. These are big planets a long way out. So HR 8799 is, could be a, little, a nice little solar system to have. But all in all, that's just a couple of ways that we're finding planets around other stars. We have so far been immensely successful in finding planets. We now know of over 4,000 planets around other stars, and this number goes up by the day. Uh, with this number, we can get some estimates about you know, how many planets there are in the universe. When we look at stars, we see, we can make a guess that there's maybe two planets per star in the universe. There's, there might be more, but that's, this is nice, a nice conservative estimate to start with. So there's two planets per star. We can guess there's 100 billion stars per galaxy. This is a pretty well-known number. And we know that there's about 100 billion galaxies in the universe. This is another uh, well-known number. So the total number of planets in the universe is going to be about 2 times 100 billion times 100 billion. That is a very large number of planets. All in all, that means that if there's 2 uh, 100 billion times 100 billion planets in the universe, there's a very good chance that something, one of those worlds, or one of their moons, contains something pretty much like us.
The hard part, however, is finding it. But we can start off by finding some planets that, you know, they could be, could be candidates for life, they could be habitable, as we call them. And it's, as of a couple years ago, we now know of, or as of now, we now know of maybe 20, 30 or so that are potentially habitable. One of them is the star, is around the star Proxima Centauri. Proxima Centauri is the nearest star to the Earth that's not the Sun. And this is really exciting because a couple years ago, we found that it had a planet a little bit bigger than the Earth, located squarely within its habitable zone. And it's, it's right next door. Uh, this is, so this was really exciting. Uh, we don't know too much about this planet yet, though. It's, uh, it's not in the best uh, orbital orientation for studying. Um, however, we can, um, we, in the near future, we might be able to figure a few things out about its surface. However, don't get too excited when um, talking about this planet. It's not, we don't know if it's, you know, just another, it's, if it's another Earth analog. Because Proxima Centauri b is, or Proxima Centauri, is not like the Sun. Proxima Centauri is one of those little stars that I mentioned had issues with habitability early in the talk. It's what's called a red dwarf. Most red dwarfs have this nasty habit of having big explosions of, on their surfaces. These big explosions eject a lot of material out into space. If one of these explosions hits the planet, uh, it, it will hit it with enough force to actually wipe out, you know, carry off some of the planet's atmosphere. And these stars, these red dwarfs, have these solar flares, as they're called, at a high enough frequency that they could, over uh, fairly uh, on kind of over too soon, too quick astronomical times, carry away the planet's atmosphere and render it uh, inhospitable. So even though we know that there is a Earth-like, Earth-sized planet around Proxima Centauri in its habitable zone, don't get too excited just yet. But there's another system that we can look at. Well, actually not but. Um, we also find in another nearby star, uh, TRAPPIST-1, we find that it has four planets in its habitable zone. So these are four planets, all of which are, again, a little bit bigger than the Earth, all in the habitable zone. And this is a really exciting find because these planets are, um, they're transiting planets. So when a planet is transiting, we would, it's much easier to study its atmosphere and its physical composition. Uh, however, again, TRAPPIST-1, the star, is a red dwarf, a flaring red dwarf. So it's, don't get too excited um, about these planets' habitability. However, I checked this morning, uh, we do know that some of these planets have thick atmospheres. So some of them might have been able to hold on to their atmosphere despite these solar flares. So the past couple of planets I've mentioned were around red dwarfs. They're not, they're not the best planets for habitability. Uh, however, we have 4,000 other planets to look at, and we do know of some uh, that have been found around more sun-like stars, less temperamental stars, more like uh, what we want, and have, we do know of some planets in their habitable zones. The Kepler spacecraft, which has been, uh, which worked tirelessly for about four years to find uh, planets, uh, it's found maybe a half a dozen or so um, that are located, that are kind of Earth-sized planets within uh, the habitable zone of their stars. There are on this plot, I believe most of these planets are from uh, are around you know, relatively sun-like stars and, 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 are, and are in hab their habitable zones. A couple of them might be red dwarf star around red dwarfs, but whatever. But we, the point is, we know of a half a dozen or so that are uh, good candidates for kind of future study and are around more uh, calmer stars. 
Well, I mentioned earlier that the TRAPPIST-1 system had planets that uh, transited in front of their stars. I mentioned that that made them easier to study. Well, the best way that we know of to study the surface of a planet and its atmosphere um, is through a, a technique we call transit spectroscopy. Transit spectroscopy is a little complicated, so I'll but I'll try and explain it as simple as I can. Uh, first, what you need to do is you take the spectra of a star when a planet is not moving in front of it. For those of you who don't know, the sp a spectrum is just looking at um, taking the light from a star and breaking it down into its individual colors, sort of telling you how much of each color um, or wavelength of light your star emits. Now, when your planet moves in front of the star, some of the star's light will actually move through the planet's atmosphere. Now, uh, when that happens, chemicals in the planet's atmosphere will absorb certain wavelengths of light, essentially kind of block certain colors of light from reaching you. And what we can do is compare the, the spectra of the star when the planet is transiting to when it's not transiting. And from that, we can actually extract the spectrum of the planet's atmosphere, and that'll tell us about, you know, what what's in the planet's what what's in the planet's atmosphere. This is a great way to find um, kind of biosignatures of life, it's like you know, if we find you know, phosphine in the atmosphere or oxygen. These are both great signals that there's some sort of biological process going on in some abundance. At the moment, this is a very very hard thing to do. It's only been done about, I think, half a dozen times or so. Um, but in the hopefully not too distant future, we will get an instrument that will be much, that'll um, be very capable of performing these sorts of measurements. So the next generation big space telescope is going to be the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, it's the successor, successor to Hubble. Hopefully, it'll launch later next year. Uh, and when it, if, when, when, let's be optimistic here, uh, when it becomes operational, it will be very well suited to doing these transit spectroscopy um, kind of observations. So that sort of wraps up our, um, you know, exoplanet-related discussion. Um, but it's not the only way that we're looking for life outside of the solar system. So the SETI program, or the Search for Extraterrestrial Life, has been scanning the sky for at least 30 years now, uh, searching for, some, for uh, communications. So uh, on the Earth, for about uh, maybe you know, 100 years, we've been broadcasting radio waves out into space. The signals, they just go flying out into, spa into, into space, into the infinite everythingness um, of the universe. There's a good chance that other civilizations are, well, doing the same thing. And there's a good chance, well, maybe not a good chance, but there's a hope that we might be able to pick up one of these signals. Something that doesn't seem quite right, doesn't seem quite natural. So uh, the SETI program has been scanning the entire, has been scanning the sky, looking for these communications. Uh, they've been uh, sort of one of their big uh, kind of, uh, tools has been the Arecibo Telescope in Puerto Rico. Uh, it's been sort of their symbol, symbolic instrument for a long time, and they've been kind of diligently searching the sky since the '90s or something. I'm not quite sure why. Um, now, they haven't found anything yet, sadly, but with every passing year, they get more and more data, and with every passing year, our technology gets better and better. And with that, I'm going to uh, wrap up. Uh, thank you, everyone, and again, thanks again for all the uh, other grad students who were kind of maybe a bit more behind the scenes for this presentation. A uh, big thanks to them for input and management. Um, I can stick around for some questions, but if you want to head out, thanks for showing up and have a great night. Okay.
So uh, if any question, if one has any questions, you know, just drop them in the chat and I will be watching. I can stick around for 15 minutes. Hey, hey Trouble. That is how you say your name, I hope. <laughs> Oh, hey, T. Okay. You're welcome. I, I had a, a great time making this. Yeah. Yes, again, um, I see the other folks have thank you. Thank you from me again. Uh, tune in again. Uh, in the near future, um, I think we're going to have like, we're having like monthly shows while the, the pandemic is ongoing. So um, we'll have some great stuff in the future. Okay. What do you think the most likely location in our solar system? Uh, what do you think is the most likely location in our solar system for life? Okay. Um, so I honestly, at the moment, I want to say Venus because of just how, because, well, for one thing, that was a, a really interesting find, the find, finding the phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, um, because that, um, pending some other uh, explanation, it's something that, um, it's something that just hasn't been explained yet through other, you know, geological or atmospheric means. Um, it also, I want that to be true because it would be so funny for Venus, the place that is oftentimes compared to, like, to hell, to be the one place that we find life outside the Earth. That would just be hilarious. Oh. What should we do about triples? Okay, um, good question. I don't know how to answer this question right now. Uh, I can't think of something clever. We'll have to excuse me. No problem. Happy to present. I love this stuff. So it's always happy. It's always fun to, to share it. Yeah, uh, for uh, Alexis's kind of comment, I've been doing this for far too long, and so my hype is too much. Okay, but, okay. So uh, for Jason's question, so on a scale of "huh" interesting to "wow," this is a really big deal. This is a really, really big deal. Hard to tell from the press, social media hype. Um. At least in my opinion, it seems like a, perhaps not a like really, really big deal, but a very quite big deal. Um, again, there's, it's hard to tell from the hype at the moment. There's still a lot of energy going on. If I remember, I saw, I saw that there was an announcement of another odd chemical in Venus's atmosphere a couple weeks ago. Um, don't quote me on this. Go look it up for yourself. Do your own research. Um, I think it's, it seems to be very promising. Uh, I'm not an expert, so I'm just sort of spec, I'm just kind of gleaming from my understanding. Um, but it, it does seem like quite a big deal because it, well, for one thing, it opens up Venus as a whole new possibility of kind of a whole new angle on finding life. Um, but it's also, it's also very kind of good evidence, so, or to my understanding. 
Okay, how likely are we to discover alien life in our lifetime? Okay, so... Huh. Well, I think if we're gonna find it in the solar system, like if we find some sort of microbes, there's a non... If it does exist in the solar system, I think there's a, a pretty good chance we might find it in the next century. Uh, because we're spending a lot of money, you know, going to places like Mars, we have the Europa submarine coming up. There's also missions going to Triton or Titan uh, that are might find something cool. So hopefully within our lifetime we'll see something that depends on if people want to send, you know, put more money into it and whatnot. Yeah, so Venus is clearly not habitable for us, but bacteria are more adaptable. Exactly. Extremophiles. What I was talking about. Thanks, Kevin. You follow news on fast radio bursts. Is there any chance these bursts are a sign of intelligent life or some other unexplained cosmological happening? Um, so I follow one of our other grad students uh, who's also a planetarium coordinator i don't think he's on tonight but he i follow his following of fast radio bursts um at the moment we don't think that they're uh, some sort of technological origin we think that they likely come from a really extreme type of stellar remnant called a pulsar um I, this is the pulsars are an entirely a topic for a whole nother talk. You could easily make one of these, or two of these about pulsars, two of these presentations. Um, but uh, we think that they're, uh, based on their energies and their um, sort of brevities, that they're probably from some sort of thing going on on the surface of a pulsar. Uh, they're probably not life. Probably. for Jason's last question if you want if you have any more questions just throw them I'm, I'm happy to answer um, just for fun the most realistic film addressing the search for life beyond earth or just favorite extraterrestrial life film in general okay so for the most realistic film uh, I it's probably contact um, they I've never actually, I, I will admit, I've never seen Contact, um, but I've heard lots of good things about it from astronomers, you know, uh, saying compared to everything else, it's quite, it does quite a good job of representing, you know, a good search for life, good first encounter situation. Um, as far as my favorite kind of alien movie, uh, it's both... Be, it being very close to Halloween and this being an honest answer, I'm quite fond of Alien. Not necessarily a happy movie or a happy first encounter, but it's a great movie. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks. Ev thanks, everyone, for showing up, and uh, I hope you all have a good night. Uh, I will stick around for, I think, you know, one more minute just to uh, answer any last-minute questions, and if not, I'll, seems like people are uh, kind of wrapping up, so uh, tune in next time again next month. I think November, let me check the calendar. When is it? 
November 18th. Write that down. Okay. Well, thank you so much, everyone, uh, for showing up, and hope again, have a great night.